Thank you all for being here. I know there was threat of storm, which hopefully will hold off until much later tonight, but I appreciate you coming out um, for this. So, okay, so um, I was asked to reflect on the practice of abstract painting as it is championed by such practitioners as Rebecca Morris and others today. And I happily agreed supplying the title that you see here on abstract painting as a placeholder. So as one does, I conjured it far in advance of tonight, so also long before seeing the show, and I meant it to be appropriately non-committal as to allow for whatever came to seem right, given what appeared on the walls. I intended the on of the title to mean about, and what I will share is still about contemporary abstraction generally, and how Rebecca manages it more specifically. But on also indicates something resting atop something else or being held by it. And I'll put up one painting here so you can have this to look at. It's more exciting than the title by a lot. Um, so I started thinking more about this most literal of indications for physical relationships as a helpful analogy for her mode of building paint fields from the horizontal support of the ground up but also for how open she is about the nature of reference to materials and their conventions, but also to the works by others, and maybe more recently herself, that have already resulted from comparable processes that subtend them. Paula Vandenbosch has written of her accumulating tools and technical facility, quote, Morris, with complete confidence in her medium, leaves her own deep trace within the material and technical aspects of painting. She employs every technical trick, playing with paint, brushing, pouring, rubbing, spraying, and laying it like bricks onto the canvas. She also makes skillful use of the properties of the materials, the inconsistencies in texture, the range of drying times, transparency versus opacity, and color tonality in different types of paint. So I liked this very much um, and wanted to kind of have it here hanging in the air. Um, so she has been very honest, I think, about coming late to the party that was modernist abstraction and found permissive pleasure in its appropriation with a difference after seeing a Robert Ryman retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art New York in 1993. And I'll come back to this in a bit. But I guess I'll say for now, um, and I wrote this down because I was traveling for the last couple of weeks and I just didn't trust myself to be coherent without a script. Um, so forgive that I'm looking down and looking up, but I'm digressive enough that I will probably meander very far from what I'm holding. Um, but the, the point that I'll say now about the Ryman, and we'll, we'll come back to him, um, is that I think it's such an interesting origin story for so many reasons, not least of which what I take to be Ryman's fundamental proposal about the possibilities of a radically reduced set of means and the kind of infinite possibilities that can be gleaned even from what seems to be a very reduced set of options. So in the case of this and, and many of his paintings, um, limiting, for example, color relationships to um, certain forms of white, but also the kind of substrates and the way that different kinds of white even might reflect or absorb ambient um, environment. Uh, so this idea of a process-based experimentation that can actually yield infinite outcomes um, through the properties of testing is something that I have found to be myself incredibly generative in Ryman's work, and I guess I'm kind of seeing in Rebecca a kindred spirit on this count as well. So beyond this candor um, about about coming late to the party that was, as I'm putting, modernist abstraction. Um, in interviews and public talks of her own, much less her manifesto, which I'll come back to that later too, the paintings themselves seem to demonstrate a comparable openness um, and a kind of proclivity to openness, I guess I'd say. They register this openness both in flaunting contingencies of making regarded as de facto composition and in the sincerity of their address. They are huge, but also intimate, soliciting engagement and then holding space. I think in this way they relate to a dynamics of pedagogy, 
structuring dialogue around the assumption not of priority, but of histories of ideas built upon others and arrived at situationally and within institutions in the course of their articulation. The work of the classroom inherently contradicts the fetish of newness, a modernist value together with authorial singularity, stylistic coherence, and the heroic subject, of course, always male by default, behind it. Rosalind Krauss mapped the dissolution of these tropes in her volume, The Originality of the Avant-Garde and Other Modernist Myths, which appeared in 1985. Against the sui generis artwork was posed an art of proliferating reference and an act of critique. Although anathema to Krauss, for Linda Nochlin, Lucy Lepard, Griselda Pollock, and others, these art historical shifts owed much to feminist interferences in a normalizing masculinist discourse. With sources clear, the point in these artistic strategies of appropriation becomes the act of recontextualization, not the creation of an artwork without precedent. This is a reflexive, if no longer medium-specific commentary on the nature of art. Its internal and self-replicating connection to media, representations, museums, and markets. And I'll put this up. So as Sherry Levine posed, the world is filled to suffocating. Man has placed his token on every stone. Every word, every image is leased and mortgaged. We know that a picture is a space in which a variety of images, none of them original, bend and clash. We can only imitate a gesture that is always anterior, never original. And so what I'm showing you, um, behind me, sorry, um, that she did a little bit after the photo-based work that she's better known for um, is work that involves modernist abstraction in some instances through specific artists, as you can see here with the Mondrian, um, but also as a kind of generic decorative scheme as you see with the, the grid on the right. So I mean by showing you this to indicate too how the legacy of conceptualism has prompted painting-based appropriation from the 1980s on, often not of specific images, although sometimes, um, as you can see here, that too, um, but also of ideas of period style much more broadly. Both engage with the sense of self-criticality developed within 20th century painting as a type of licensed introspection regarding the nature of painting, whether in historical, material, or institutional senses. So, so too do Rebecca's paintings nod to other artists and categories. To Ryman or Joan Brown, and I'll just say this is just a small um, sampling of not everything that I'm enumerating, uh, suprematism and Memphis design, Agnes Martin and maps, pattern and decoration, and Chicago images, Laura Owens and Allison Miller, among others, and what Catherine Wagley memorably dubbed the female cool school, Matisse and macrame. And they do this openly without being diminished by their comparative referential force. And so in what I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of the time that we have together, is not gonna be a kind of one-to-one -one comparison of any kind, um, but rather to think more about what it means for there to be so many kind of inputs to um, a practice of this kind. Um, and in some ways to model against Levine's idea of foreclosure, which admittedly is a generative proposition that for her, as well as many others, abetted instead of foreclosed the production of still more work. Um, the material interference, the traction of paint, um, and many other factors, I think here introduce unknowns that admit possibility as inherent within process instead of the inverse. And so, um, just to put this up as a kind of, um, you know, counterpoint in some ways to all of this maybe comes to this, um, I wanna suggest that the references here are associative rather than duplicative, um, which is again, another way of saying that I'm not gonna do a kind of one-to-one -one correlation. But I think for me, part of the pleasure of this work is that it sets my mind kind of imagining all of these other vectors and comparisons and kind of dialogical conversations that I imagine these works to be having with um, some of their, their peers and precedents. Um, so I wanna offer some thoughts about this work relative to um, that of other artists, 
stressing as I already am the structuring of abstraction as something capable of picturing the necessary multiplicity of relationships as something like a nominal subject. So uh, to be sure, Rebecca is not singular in this regard. And if anything, this disposition toward engaged practice would not want it otherwise. It puts me in mind of an amazing press release, which I'll come to in just a second, that related to these works by Ruth Root. And so I'm showing you two works that are really thin metal um, paintings that are hung very flush to the wall. And the works themselves are really terrific. But what I have in mind here as being even more germane is this, which is a press release that she made for a show at Andrew Krepp's gallery in New York in 2008 where Root placed, uh, sorry, placed heterogeneous sources into the form of a mathematical equation. Ellsworth Kelly, Joseph Albers, and Blinky Palermo were given the same value as such items as bath mats and ski socks. All of these components were connected by plus signs, the sum total of which equaled the exhibition. So this is like very literal, like these are all plus signs and at the end there's a little equal sign and I know that I'm realizing it's very hard to see. Um, so far from reducing her wafer-thin paintings to their sources, the mood board grid gamely revealed a tendency to accumulate and synthesize, a version of consuming and the act of producing, admitting, in fact, that consuming is necessary for producing, that acknowledges precedent. It also importantly maintains authorship, since, Ruth takes, since Root takes responsibility for those selections and what they help to generate. In a more recent series shown here um, at 356 Mission in 2017, which maybe some people have the chance to see, um, she made such appropriations even clearer within the paintings themselves. Each work has two discrete but interlocking physical sections, one of pattern fabric of the artist's own design, as you can see at the top, uh, pulled taut over softly sweating, softly, I can't talk tonight, sorry, um, over um, softly swelling um, batting, and the other painted plexiglass, which hangs from the first like a giant earring from a lobe or attaches to it in some other manner of dependency. The fabric is a sort of digital sampler, comprising portraits of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, textile fragments from Sonia Delaunay, the sharp geometry of a security envelope design, a pizza slice, and icons of Ruth's own art, and what becomes a miniature retrospective. And so I guess I'm, I'm using this in some ways to kind of think about the structure of appropriative communion and how it maintains kind of visibility or pressures the work even when it remains very squarely um, outside of its frame too. Still, this transparency is rarer than it should be and has been seemingly besides the point in the time period that this show traverses. This was a period marked not only by lingering suspicion of painting as a hangover from the 1980s and 90s, the medium thrown out with the bathwater of modernism, but its subsequent recuperation as process-driven conceptualism that just happened to appear on canvas as one possibility among so many other formats. Conceptual painting was ubiquitous in the 2000s. Much of this conceptual painting engaged in various forms of de-skilling, a Sisyphean task enacted continually and never completed, not even with the advent of digital technology, for authorship here too is never fully expunged. In 2007, for example, Wade Guyton began to produce would-be black monochromes made with a computer and an Epson large format printer that spits ink onto pre-primed linen intended for oil paint. Despite the uniform process, the results vary with the amount of ink, overprinting slippages, imperfect sinks, or the printer running askew. Print settings, draft, economy, better, best, worst, black and white, and color, give Guyton his only mechanisms of regulation. The images can run to impossible lengths checked only by the architectural and institutional parameters of the site. But even in his work, the artist is an instigator of a process that he commences, executes, and legitimizes. Um, so you've probably, most of you, seen these, um, but maybe not all had the opportunity to see how they're fabricated, which is what you're looking at, of course, on the left. Um, so the theme 
in the middle of this is from where the um, where the fabric has been folded to insert into the printer. So impediments here function as restraints against which to generate form. Too often the process becomes a tactic to avoid responsibility, as though being non-committal about this position or meeting could subvert the passage to commodity. This might be theorized as a latter-day object-oriented dematerialization of painting, this time happening from within the medium, not from without, as was the case in the 1970s, when Lepard diagnosed the condition. In any case, whatever the means, the process is also a means to an end, an end that is ultimately a painting. This point was taken to its logical conclusion in the 2010s, when abstraction was flourishing apart from medium specificity and without its progressive ideal, but with explicit framing of ego disinvestment in and through process, and an eye to contaminated histories of painting that these artists knew better than to uncritically extend. A subset of abstract work that is conceptual in this vein ironically came to appear so absent of meaning as to return painting to 1980s-like debates around the empty commodity. So critic and artist Walter Robinson penned a piece called Flipping and the Rise of Zombie Formalism in 2014, in which he coined this term zombie formalism, defined as a, quote, straightforward, reductive, essentialist method of making a painting that brings back to life the discarded aesthetics of Clement Greenberg. When Jerry Salt entered the discussion with zombies on the wall, why does so much abstraction look the same? Uh, he added to the monikers, noting the colloquial instances of, quote, modest abstraction, neo-modernism, MFA abstraction, and crabstraction. The gendered variants are chickstraction and dickstraction. Um, Rhonda Lieberman also got to the point with a piece called The Art of the 1% and calling this work aestheticized loot. Perhaps it is unnecessary to say that these are all pejorative labels, ways of panning abstraction as primarily a market phenomenon where individual works are visually interchangeable assets. And indeed it was Saltz who most forcefully extended the critique of the work made as high-end interior decor, and that's what you're looking at here. Um, uh, uh, this is part of this post that I'm just about to describe. By posting pictures of gridded, monochromatic, chicly muted, smudge covered, printed, or stenciled paintings that he took at galleries and art fairs over the course of the year. Um, so you're seeing here just one of his many kind of um, uh, sets of juxtapositions. So he was kind of, you know, going around and taking pictures and finding similarities in these otherwise, I would say, radically disparate practices, but finding these formal um, analogies and rhymes and reducing the work to them um, in these kind of gridded shots. So the point of such clickbait was that the painting's visual equivalents existed within subgroups that could be kind of, um, kind of isolated and categorized. So paintings with splatters say, a striking demonstration of their fungibility, the interchangeability of the units um, in the market. But the presumption that the paintings look similar um, might be considered a kind of pseudomorphism after all, a term referring to the way that we consider things that look alike to be connected allowing formal likeness to obscure the differences in positions behind their conception and intent. Still, so caricatural had these styles and procedural chronicles become that in 2015, Seth Price published a polemical um, text in the form of a novel masquerading as a memoir, uh, Buck Seth Price, in which they served as the target of easy contempt, where he wrote, quote, tepid compositions, hesitant and minimal in appearance, kind of pretty and kind of whatever. So alongside these decades of consistent, if different kinds of antagonism to what painting might be, but also what it might do or how it might function um, in a market economy or plenty of other spaces and systems, um, Rebecca began, began painting in the 1990s, uh, works that are um, uh, before what we see in the show here, but that were included in the 2005 show at the Renaissance Society, um, and I have an image of that here, and which this show so expertly curated by Jamila James is careful not to redouble, 
And I went back to look at these images and I was so excited to see um, that, which I hadn't remembered. Um, and just thinking of all these kind of gridded systems and kind of experimentation with materials and the idea of the sampler, um, I just, it was I don't know, a really great, um, really great introduction to that show and to the work. So Stephen Westfall has written of um, her early work um, and the use of painting in the 1990s following a period of sticker collages um, and glitter work in other media. And he says this, and actually, because you're here, I wanted, I meant to ask you this, and maybe we can talk about this later. But I, I didn't realize until this that you did the sticker works. And then I was thinking Mary Weatherford also did these kind of little sticker collages in the late 80s, but long before you knew each other. But I was interested in the fact you were both using stickers as kind of transitional objects into painted abstraction. But anyway, maybe, maybe later or for another time. Okay. Um, so Stephen Westfall writes, Morris may have returned to painting because it seemed the proper material for enlarging the scale of her work. But the material shift had a concrete impact where color and tactility would resist interpretation for a longer stretch of time. I really loved this and wanted to share that. Um, so for her part, Rebecca said of her move into not just painting, but into abstraction, quote, it was a revelation. I was really excited. I had really done it, gone abstract. It felt so much better, more natural to me, as if my real work had started. So now we're back at the origin scene of the Ryman show at MoMA in 1993, um, about which she said, seeing that work opened up to me what abstraction was. It was that simple. I had been overthinking it making it too hard. Um, and I'm showing you here a floor plan and just one of the installation shots. And I don't, I don't really know why I put the introduction to the show, I guess, to place you in that space. Um, but also the press release in case you want to see how Momo was framing it at the time. Um, but I think it's really important that it was, um, uh, I guess, maybe this part. While Ryman practices the most reductive form of painting, generally limiting himself to white paint and a square format, his work is nonetheless both intensely expressive and visually rich. By varying the scale and material of the support he paints on, the brushes and death strokes he uses, and the fasteners with which he attaches the wood to the wall, Ryman explores a myriad of formal possibilities while realizing paintings of unusual elegance and luminosity. Um, but I do think there's something to that as the kind of crux of maybe what captured your attention um, in this. Um, and the way I would characterize Ryman's work is very much on these terms as well. Um, thinking about him as working over the medium's conventions, um, which was coeval with the methodical testing of its components. Not simply paint and its application, but also the support, the edge, the means of securing the painting to the wall, the conditions of ambient or artificial lighting. Um, and I think it's also pretty remarkable. And when I was thinking about all of the gestures and uses of materials on view, even just within the painting set that we have you know, behind us here, um, I wanted to read you just some of the materials that Ryman used as well to get this sense of kind of material fluency as something that is arrived at through testing and combinations and admixtures and kind of not knowing in advance what these uh, tools or uh, kind of recipes would yield. Um, but I always think that his checklists read like inventory. So oil, acrylic, pastel, gouache, rabbit skin glue, charcoal, graphite, enamel, varathane, vinyl, polymer, ballpoint pen, um, unstretched size linen, stretched size canvas, burlap, steel, printed wallpaper, coffee filter paper, and so on. And so although his paintings are often described as white, like the one I showed initially, his work is in fact rich with color, the hue located in the range of matte and reflective surfaces and on the grounds of buttery brown aged paper or cold gray metal, the chalky white of bleached cotton or the layers of vivid turquoise, teal, pink, red, and gold beneath other forms of um, kind of spackled white. I would say that he made more out of his supplies than anyone else in the past century, coaxing compositional elements from exposed nails, strips of tape, and all manner of fasteners. Reflexivity about every facet of painting remained primary. And I wanted to show you just a couple more that I thought were really kind of resonant with, with again, I'm like 
I don't know. I think I'm really sleep deprived. I can't talk. I can't point. Um, thank you for your generosity in the face of all this tonight. Um, but this is one of my favorites, and it, it I think is resonant here. Um, it's a piece that's at Dia Beacon. If any of you have had the opportunity to see that permanent installation there, I guess quasi permanent. And it's a very, very small work, so seeing it large is really kind of silly. Um, but it's a very small canvas, and he you know, drew lines of um, you know, graphite on it, and then um, and he had it he had it uh, unstretched and then restretched it, and so the tension kind of warped the the lines um, through pulling them taut. So it's this idea of the force actually creating the surface, but also creating the composition in addition to the linear elements or what was put down on the ground. That it's a kind of active engagement materially that produces the composition. Um, but also in the same years, he was doing many that kind of apportioned pages or canvases in various ways, thinking about where the demarcation of a grid would go. Would it, as in this one, extend to the edge? Or would it actually be contained within other elements that would share um, kind of compositional priority? Would one element carve out or make space for another? Would it cradle it? Would it supersede it? Um, and so I'm using language of relationships, and I see these as deeply kind of um, humanist propositions, actually. Um, the MoMA press release, I know, used this language of expressivity, and many of his works are incredibly facture-laden still. Um, but I think even in the ones that are less so, they involve these kind of formal um, structural decisions that are really also decisions about care and placement and how items in the world exist um, in relation to others as they're kind of um, successively engaged. So, um, oh yeah, and this is another thing um, that I was thinking as I was putting all this together. He also was a musician initially, and this is, do I have time? Yes, okay, this will be a super quick digression. So he was actually a jazz musician, and when he moved to New York from um, Tennessee, he actually took a job at the at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art, as a relief guard because he was training to be a saxophonist and he was able to use the museum auditorium when no one was in there. And so it was basically a performance space because he didn't have that in his apartment. Um, but thinking about jazz and improvisation and also just his relation to music, even after he became um, a kind of as he considered to be absolutely like full-time visual artist. Um, but I was thinking about that with, you know, with music and um, your family history and thinking about this kind of relation of music to abstraction um, in a kind of modernist setting here too. Um, okay, so um, I was thinking a lot about then this idea of kind of, you know, strategies and tropes and formats, formal decisions that are also material decisions. And I think hopefully most people have had the chance to go through the show already. Um, but I really liked how it's set out in relation not to chronology, but to these kinds of formal strategies and thinking about the way that I think the work is kind of querying them, um, in some cases successively, but also kind of layering um, and building recursively um, on them from work to work or even within a single work. Um, so one, for example, would be the grid, which I thought had just such a kind of um, clear relevance to what we were just talking about. But these ideas of breaking space and containing space, um, thinking about margins and marginalia and kind of where what we're supposed to be looking at is happening within any given paint field. Um, and then also, yeah, change. Um, this idea of framing within frames um, or different kinds of pictures within pictures. And so, I mean, as maybe I'll go back for just a second, even as something like this is meant to kind of telegraphically communicate, there are plenty of modernist precedents for this. But I also thought in taking seriously um, your call for macrame and the idea of references that exist far outside of kind of histories of modernist painting, I started thinking a lot about other forms of images and also just types of work that hold kind of histories of other works from, from within. Um, so ideas of whether it's kind of or quilts that have kind of samples of different patterns um, or in the case of the painting of the Louvre, um, 
but just this idea that a work of art can necessarily contain references to other works of art, um, but that it can also be a space of testing out um, one's own kind of relation to that history in the course of, of making that work. And so maybe this is a kind of, you know, another, I guess I am showing you another modernist example after all, um, but I, I just had to with this one. Um, but thinking about the way that these works, um, I'm sorry, I guess I'm going forward and backward. Works like this have these kind of, um, th these kind of densities uh, within them. And I was thinking of them as kind of constellations and competing, but also complementary points of attention. But I think they're also almost like miniature retrospectives from within or ways of kind of thinking about aggregations of images. Um, and I was thinking about this a lot in relation to not only forms of historical, again, textile work or modernist painting, but also forms of image aggregation from, you know, the last 20 years. And, you know, I guess maybe we're all especially attuned to this living through now, I guess, almost three years of, you know, gridded zooms, um, but all forms of, you know, whether it's prezies or uh, Pinterest boards or ideas of digital samplers of various kinds, um, thinking about how these works in some ways are analogs to forms of kind of image archives and thinking about the relation of images always in relation to other images that I think is very much a kind of condition of the period that this show traverses. Um, and so how do we kind of image this for now? And I think it's, it's that. Um, but also where the kind of authorial presence exists in relation to this work. And so I think this is maybe a kind of a strange thing to be showing. Um, but I was thinking a lot about this idea of kind of the artist in the world, in this case of his making, um, but also the idea of the kind of pleasures of illusionism and the idea of the surface as something both um, kind of performative, um, as something potentially illusionistic deep in its recess, but also kind of very much right there on the surface. And the way that this work um, really asks for a kind of suspension of disbelief. And I don't know that we still are afforded always the same pleasures in looking at painting, but I think what's really remarkable about a lot of these works behind us, in front of you, um, is that it's kind of doing both things for me. I think there's still a kind of sense of illusionistic depth of layering of a surface being held, of things on other things um, that are also then material as well as kind of conceptual or illusionistic um, in some other way. But also thinking about um, Ad Reinhardt's uh, great slide archives um, and just the idea of images upon images. So apropos of this desire for organization within the bounds of an image as well as across them, Alan Picaro has written of Morris there's an entire branch of psychology devoted to investigating our mind's propensity to organize disparate visual elements into coherent wholes. And Morris's best works, and maybe I'll come back so you can actually be looking at it as we're talking, um, probably escaped from the same lab. By embracing the atomization um, of thematic and stylistic unity, her works embody these fractured conditions as we find them reflected in contemporary culture, even if they're not specifically commenting on them. Like that first taste of the unfamiliar on an unexpectant tongue, these are paintings that you have to work for, but if you do, you will earn your keep. So, okay, so we'll leave that behind. Um, so what I wanted to kind of end with was the manifesto, um, which um, maybe is not exactly the intentionality of the practice, but certainly a motivation. Um, it's cause, if not its effects. And so some of you probably are, are, uh, have seen this before. Um, it's the great manifesto for abstractionists and friends of the non-objective that was first read by Hamza Walker in, 20, in 2005 at the Renaissance Society during the exhibition talk for the Rebecca Morris Paintings 96 to 2005 exhibition. And it was first published in the 2006 Art Forum on the occasion um, of that uh, of a solo show um, at Gallery Barbara Weiss um, in 2006. And so the story that Rebecca has, has told me, which I'll share and tell me if I'm getting it wrong, was that it was, um, it was being kind of like circulated and people were, were tearing it out of, um, uh, people were 
uh, it was first published in art form and then um, people were tearing it out, so then you revisited the idea later um, as well. So it, I think, is a really an interesting, the idea that the manifesto would occupy the space of the advertisement and think about how it relates to the practice that it's framing. And I realize I'm going, I thought I didn't have so much to say, but it turns out I guess I have more to say than I realized. So I'm gonna skip over this pretty quickly because I wanna get to the end so we have time to talk without holding you up so long tonight. So this will be a little bit briefer than I had wanted it to be, but I was thinking about this idea of the magazine as a kind of container for manifesto and that manifestos can kind of have very different visual forms and very different modes of, of engaging audiences. So um, maybe not surprisingly for, for some people, maybe for others, um, this very much came to mind, which is the Linda Banglis um, poster um, advertisement that she made. Um, that was also in an art forum in the December 1974 issue, which was at the time um, such a watershed that actually five editors denounced it as an object of extreme vulgarity, which brutalized both um, the editors and the readers. Um, but Bangla saw it very differently um, and thought it was the ultimate mockery of the pinup and the macho, um, and also the way that she was provoking um, the kind of positionality of the female artist within the art world of that moment. Um, but it also made me think about, oh, I'm sorry, this is probably really hard to see. Um, just because we were talking about Ryman, he also did an art forum ad in 1976, um, which was supposed to be actually for a show of his own, but it actually became an ad really for art forum, um, which I thought was this wonderfully weird kind of self-effacing gesture where he's basically telling people to buy the magazine instead of doing the kind of performative work for his own, his own work. So to come back to this as a way to wrap up, um, I was interested in this um, and the way that it still is incredibly relevant now. Um, and I know you were asked in the opening conversation for the show whether there was the need to kind of update it and there is this idea that no, it still functions perfectly well. And so I wanted to end by thinking about like how is this model relevant now and how can abstraction um, embody and embed relations rather than self-enclosure? Uh, maybe we can say it was never really autonomous, but I think it's still a good moment to ask why that was the wish and what um, hopes that that fantasy fulfilled. And I guess I want us to think in the end too about a very different impulse in our own time. And so this is maybe a kind of strange segue to my, this is like my penultimate point. Um, so I've been really interested in the past few months about this kind of move in other industries to these ideas of transparency. So these are images from two New York Times pieces from the last couple months. The one on the left is from what if you could read a fashion label like a food label. So this is a, a, an article that talked about transparency and traceability. They say it's all the rage when it comes to clothing and it is finally reaching the tags on the racks. So the idea is that clothing might have labels that help consumers trace the creation of a garment, tracking software for the garment, but also for authenticity in relation to counterfeit and the resale market, but also sustainable materials and humane labor practices. Um, and what you're looking at on the right is um, a kind of, a kind of, in my mind, related related piece um, that was actually about uh, about Adam Pendleton and the way that Alexander McQueen, the fashion house, used his kind of visual rhetoric of graffiti to make their own clothes, which people immediately thought were Adams, but they were not. Um, and so it engendered this conversation around um, appropriation and reference. And I'm just gonna read you um, a quote from, from this piece. So at issue is a confluence of factors, including fashion's own culture, which has long plundered history and references with impunity and fetishized creativity and newness. As a result, said Susan Scafitti, the founder of the Fashion Law Institute at Fordham, it has created, quote, a fear that something is not valuable if it acknowledges its own imaginative antecedents. Increasingly, art schools, including Central St. Martin's and the Savannah College of Art and Design, are teaching students to effectively footnote their mood boards. 
And as the drive towards sustainability forces brands to trace their materials and supply chains and make that information transparent, there's no reason why they couldn't add creative DNA to the list. Quote, consumers love to know the story behind a product, said Dirk Standen, the dean of school of fashion at SCAD. Um, Ms. Scafidi agreed. We need to develop a culture of acknowledgement, she said. It would be great for the brand and good source um, sorry, and good for the source and good for the consumer. So I wanted to think about a kind of bad definition of abstraction here, the action of taking something away unlawfully or dishonestly, stealing, theft, or embezzlement. Um, so if not that, where, where are we left? Um, and I wanted to end with this, um, this idea of the working archive, um, which is actually maybe not exactly back to the origin scene of MoMA um, and Ryman's exhibition in 93, but actually an evolving studio wall that he maintained for much of his working life where he would take these tiny black and white photos of you know, oftentimes largely white paintings that were essentially you know, indecipherable at this scale and with this kind of impoverished form of you know, photographic mediation. Um, but it points to the fact that this work was ongoing. Um, and I think it's really important because it is essentially an expanding grid, lacking in visual incident by virtue of its scale and gray tones and crucially indifferent to sequence and its assemblage. As Ryman proposed in 1969 and would assert thereafter, the basic problem was always what to do with paint. There is never a question of what to paint, he said, but only how to paint. And so when he was asked about this by Robert Storr, um, he asked him whether he believed that abstract painting requires a sense of overall historical or aesthetic direction. Ryman replied, quote, I don't know. I think maybe it doesn't. It does from time to time, and it does in small ways. There are problems that if you work on and there is an awareness of what has been done, what others have worked on, and how they've approached painting and the solutions that they've come to. It isn't a blanket kind of historical thing that everyone is involved with, but I think that everyone has to take little bites, little pieces of it, and work on that. But I don't know that there's any big philosophy that encompasses it all. So I thought this was like a really um, moving statement when I read it many years ago and has informed a lot about how I've thought about abstraction, which is not to say that it doesn't have historical coordinates. Um, but maybe there's not one version of abstraction and maybe in fact it is much more contingent and situational than we've ever allowed it to be. Um, and I guess to end here where we are, um, in Morris's manifesto, I see coordinates, plans for work without stipulating outcome, allowing for the contingency occasions like this offer and recalling the classroom reference with which I began, it remains I think despite or maybe exactly because of this a manifesto for work, but not a manual. So I will end there.